frequently hear these days that Europe is facing a crisis brought about by the Brexit vote in June 23, 2016, <coughs> by the financial crisis that has revealed the divisions between centre and periphery in the Eurozone, and by the refugee crisis and the problematic agreement between the EU and Turkey. However, the idea of Europe being in a state of crisis is hardly a new one. Writing in September 1961, the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre criticized the abstract, narcissistic, and pseudo-universal European values of freedom, democracy, and philosophical rational thinking, concluding that the only way the European could make himself a man was by fabricating slaves and monsters, and that Europeans baptize their commonwealth of crimes, fraternity, and love. What this quotation showcases is the normalization of the crisis in the European project. And this uh, idea of the crisis, not as an exception to the rule, but as something ordinary, uh, is something that has been elaborated by many contemporary cultural theorists, not as something unusual, but as something which is part and parcel of our sort of political, historical and social uh, reality. Some of the questions we want to ask is, how have European films prefigured the now dominant idea of Europe being in a state of crisis? How have they addressed issues of economic inequality, labor exploitation, the re-emergence of nationalism, and the refugee crisis? But also following Elsaizer, how can European cinema its institutions manage conflict in the post-Brexit era? Quand on vit dans la rue, il faut s'économiser. Un petit café. Il faut prendre son temps. J'ai compris. On ne parle pas de boulot. En même temps, avec Ben, parle de boulot. Hé, hey, note. Je m'appelle pas Benoît, je m'appelle note. Non, c'est important, ça. Arrête, je le connais, ton discours. Je présume que tout ça, pour toi, c'est l'ennemi. So the film is trying to open a kind of political door, a kind of work upon the self, a kind of work upon the scandalous self as a way of opening a door onto the future beyond neoliberal labour. Um, but the film is called Le Grand Soir, which, you know, the big revolutionary day, the day will come. They invite everybody to come and rebel uh, in the last scene of the film. They, they, they invite them to a meeting and nobody turns up. The rules of the European game. Uh, I'm trying to take a bit of a long historical build up to the present. Renoir's Rules of the Game offers a savage critique of the European aristocratic tradition associated with monarchical rule. The long connection then to Chevalier, to, to bring that in, is that in a sense the re-establishment of new rules of the game under conditions of neoliberalism really take us back to a pre-democratic tradition where uh, rules, this time the rules of the market, the rules of absolute competition are now the rules by which everyone must live and everyone must be subservient to them. A striking example of the Eurocentric nature of this well-intentioned but problematic tendency in which refugees and asylum seekers are marginalised or even evacuated from a narrative of European benefaction uh, is provided by uh, the short film Ode to Lesvos. Όλα αυτά τα σωσίβια που βλέπουμε εδώ είναι κόσμος. Κόσμος μέσα χιλιάδες κάθε μέρα. Lots of us here, I'm interested in thinking about Europe, not just as a place of safety, the more or less mythical site of democracy and civilization and enlightenment, but also as a project that has always been constituted in terms of other societies and cultures, largely through systematic violence. Yeah, what, what I'm trying to pull out is um, how there's some apparently uh, shared approach to capturing 
these events that we that we assume to kind of know in some way, these kind of acts of protest, these acts of public demonstration, whether that involves a protest for fictive ethnicity, for acts of kind of expressive, like expressive acts of nationalism, or whether that involves a kind of counter to that. Um, so what I am finding is that there's a kind of shared interest in using the observational mode in order to do this. So it seems, at least in a particular sphere, that being the intersection between documentary and the gallery, that the observational mode is being preferred to, to, con to kind of deconstruct what's happening. So then I thought what well, maybe would be quite useful to talk about are actually the politics of European film festivals. What, what kind of politics actually do these um, institutions subscribe to or represent? And I picked up the case of Berlinale because um, it's um, widely uh, known as um, the most politicized um, A film festival. The festival is trying to package itself as a very relevant and politically kind of aware event and it does it through its through the festival's presentation in the mass media. So this is a, just a little clip from Euronews which kind of um, was filmed sometime um, at the start of the festival. A lot has changed in the world since Berlin's film festival last opened its doors. As the red carpet is rolled out for stars of the screen, concrete barriers are also going up. A reminder of the tragic events in December when a truck slammed into a Christmas market in the German capital, killing 12 people. Dorota, thanks very much for a really interesting paper. I mean, you're Thank totally you. persuaded that we have to go way beyond film studies in order to describe these sorts of uh, uh, occasions. Uh, I, I think your um, application of uh, Bakhtin's idea of the chronotope to was, did you say the festive or festive. the festival? Festive. 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 Uh, it obviously gives the lie to you saying that you're not a theoretician, because that's exactly what you're doing. Oh, thank you. But I wanted to uh, ask you to talk about the time aspect of the chronotope. You've talked about the space aspect here. I think what interests me is how festival manages to create a kind of imaginary architecture for itself just for the time of the festival and it manages to insert this architecture into the real architecture into the actual space and there is an in interaction I think that's a basically I think my point is that it's a temporal event which is a recurrent one and it's being modulated both by the space and the historical time in which this festival happens I would like to push you back towards this question of the ethical, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and bring together what you said on um, Free Colours Blue uh, into conversation slightly with what Martin was saying with Le Grand Soir. Um, so for Martin, it seemed that Le Grand Soir kind of brings to light some potentially ethical political subject, or so subjectivity. Yeah. Um, and this comes through, from, from my understanding of it, the demand for a kind of personal emotional labor and in that sense some kind of self-sacrificing alongside some recognition of a more systemic violence the, the kind of negotiation between these okay. and i think that's seems to be more or less what's happening in some ways in free colors blue right that kind of really demanding process that um julia binoche and her character is going through at the outset before before that road to freedom yeah and one of the things that strikes me about kind of, you know, if you're going to talk about the genre of refugee film, it seems to me that when you ask about the question of permission and the question of access, people kind of say, no, no, but the story's really worthy, so therefore we don't have to worry about that. And I'm, worried, I'm just wondering about this particular film, if you have any sense of the, the sense of relationship of the people in the image, in the film, to their image, and what will happen to their image afterwards. Brian Winston once said, uh, I think writing about the Man of, Man of Aaron, Informed consent is a convenient lie, you know, because you make consent there and then, but what happens to the circulation of the film over time in, in different networks is not under your control. So it's a convenient uh, myth for document filmmakers. On the other hand, I think a lot of filmmakers say, uh, I'm guessing Rosie did this, would say if you said yes on camera, that would suffice. So you don't literally physically sign a form. Um, I know that he was very concerned about the last... See, the last sequence he shot, which was of the dead bodies, he felt awful about doing that. Morally, he's spoken about the pain of doing that, you know, such as it is. But 
he did feel it was necessary for the film to do that. But of course, the dead can't uh, give consent. Yeah.